Well, hello everybody and welcome to this double I, double S seminar on Navy's climate change and a new environment. I'm Nick Childs. I'm the senior fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security here at the double I, double S. Um, this is a, a webinar that's really like many of those that we are attending now at the moment taking place, of course, in the shadow of COVID-19. No doubt it'll intrude somewhat on our discussion today, but before that, the environment generally and climate in particular had been steadily rising up the league table of global strategic concerns. And to, to my mind, at least, the issues around climate are in many ways intrinsically maritime, rising sea levels, melting ice, threats to coasts and littoral communities. But what does that mean for navies and, and maritime security? And that's what we're going to be discussing today. And in, in particular, in the context of this webinar, how the Royal Navy is responding to these issues. Fortunately for this session, we have an excellent panel of four speakers. We have Shiloh Fetzek, who's Senior Fellow for International Affairs at the Center for Climate and Security in Washington. She's actually joining us from Minneapolis, so welcome to you. Dr. Alessio Patalano, reader in East Asian Warfare and Security at the Par Department of War Studies, King's College London. Mark Thompson, a Director of Sustainability and Climate Change at Price Waterhouse Coopers. And Vice Admiral Jerry Kidd, who is the Fleet Commander. Royal Navy. I'll introduce them all again in turn shortly and they'll speak for about 10 minutes each, give or take, and then we'll have a chance for a discussion, a question and answer session. And for that, you have a couple of options to participate. Either you can open the Q&A window and type in a question, which I can put to the panelists, or you can list uh, or hit the raise hand function and we can activate your microphone so you can put your question directly, although you are liable also to appear in vision. So you might want to reflect on that depending on which option you want to choose. Without further ado, um, I'd like to invite our first speaker for this session, uh, Shiloh Fetzek, uh, to take the floor beyond her current role at the Center for Climate and Security. She has focused on climate change and the environment in terms of international affairs and security for well over a decade, including with us here at the IISS and at the IUSI. Uh, and she remains an associate fellow at the IISS. So Shiloh, first, over to you. I think you have to unmute. Well, we've been doing Zoom meetings for two months, right? <laughs> um, thanks a lot, Nick, for convening this conversation. I'm going to cover three things. Uh, an introduction to the climate security nexus, climate security implications for the military, and what these changes mean in the high north. So climate change is a threat multiplier for instability. It can exacerbate the drivers of fragility and conflict, undermining food and water insecurity, livelihoods, driving migration, intercommunal tensions, grievances against government, and so forth. In addition to driving new instability, climate change can make ongoing conflicts more difficult to resolve. So Yemen, for example, was already extremely water scarce before the war destroyed so much of their infrastructure. And the way forward for them is going to be really complicated in a hotter and, dry and drier Middle East in addition to these dynamics, there's also a feedback cycle whereby once a situation is unstable, it becomes difficult to implement climate adaptation measures, making an area more vulnerable to climate impacts and the potential security repercussions. So climate security vulnerability is self-reinforcing. This raises the risk of cascading disasters where a climate shock increases vulnerability to subsequent ones and you may end up with complex crises that involve conflicts, disasters, humanitarian crises, together. Areas that are strategically significant for Europe and the Americas are experiencing these dynamics. 
Syria and Iraq, for example, it's going to be really difficult to restore rural livelihoods in areas formerly controlled by IS. Water scarcity in Afghanistan drives po opium poppy cultivation, the trade in which uh, the Taliban thrives on. And we've seen how these problems don't stay uh, where they originate. Climate change is also about much more than changing weather patterns. The energy transition will force petro states to restructure and diversify their economies. And demand for renewable technologies is changing the strategic value of minerals like lithium. There's also a climate nuclear security nexus whereby a number of countries have stated their intention to increase nuclear in their energy mix under uh, climate mitigation efforts. These include climate and security vulnerable countries like Bangladesh, the Philippines, uh, Egypt and Turkey already have active nuclear programs and are highly climate vulnerable. This may present new challenges in terms of nuclear safety issues or nuclear materials security issues in countries that have active violent extremist organizations. Countries that are nuclear weapon states also are highly climate vulnerable and that might lead to new types of, of potential for a misunderstanding between these countries. Broadly, that's the nature of the threat. So it's clear that climate change is reshaping the domain. For the military, this has implications for readiness, for operations, and for strategy. In terms of readiness, climate change can lead to the loss of training days due to heat, for example, and will have a major impact on military installations. Coastal installations highly vulnerable to sea level rise and storms. Diego Garcia often gets mentioned as a, a key operational hub in the Indian Ocean. Just a quick sidebar on climate science that's relevant for naval interests. The last time that the atmosphere was two to three degrees warmer than pre-industrial levels, which is what we're headed for by the end of the century, sea levels were 25 to 35 meters higher than they are now. Granted, that was a very long time ago, but the atmospheric and oceanic physics are the same. We often talk about what the sea levels will be in the year 2100 and other climate impacts kind of cap it at the end of the century. However well we succeed in emissions reduction in the coming decades, sea levels will continue to rise for millennia, mostly driven by thermal expansion. It can affect the rate of that change, but not the eventual amount. So in terms of naval readiness, we can raise piers, build seawalls to protect assets and such, but sea level rise will continue to be an ongoing problem. In terms of climate impacts on operations, for navies, this will mean many more civil, civil affairs operations, humanitarian assistance and disaster response, and the strategic value of humanitarian assistance and disaster response will also increase. More search and rescue operations, the New Zealand Navy is finding that it's uh, involved in more rescue operations for fishermen who've been pursuing fish further and further afield as climate change changes their range and they require rescue. There will be a much greater need for maritime domain awareness, particularly in the Pacific, driven by an increase in illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. Again, as climate change kind of re, uh, relocates where, where um, fish are operating. To the extent that climate change is a driving factor in more piracy, more human trafficking, more drug trafficking, naval forces may be involved in countering these or in responding to new areas of instability, new types of the uh, complex conflict and disaster crises I mentioned earlier. In terms of war fighting, that's a more complex question to anticipate, but it's important to gain that out possibly more freedom of navigation operations, and I think Alessio will speak to contested maritime boundaries. Lastly, on strategy, these changes are being incorporated into military and Navy strategies to build capacity and the partnerships necessary in order to assess the threat, predict its impacts, and adapt to the changes that climate change will bring. One of the places that the domain is changing most dramatically, of course, is in the high north. The opening of commercial opportunities, shipping, oil and gas, mining, fishing, tourism, make the region a new geostrategic corridor. And this increases the strategic significance of the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap, as well as the Bering Strait. 
It's really worth looking beyond the sensationalist headlines and political rhetoric and discussions of Arctic security. Most of the resources are already allocated based on UNCLOS rules, and it will remain a really difficult operating environment for industry for some time. We'll have seen the oil spill in Siberia last week caused by thawing permafrost cracking the foundation on a, a power plant's diesel tank. There are a number of reasons why avoiding conflict in the Arctic will be in Arctic countries and industries self-interest. Any kind of kinetic confrontation will also make it harder to get insurance for these operations. Uh, but nevertheless, commercial opportunities there continue to shape its geostrategic importance, particularly for Russia, where climate change is driving both opportunities and also vulnerabilities. A quarter of its GDP is derived from north of the Arctic Circle, and its northern fleet nuclear deterrent is based out of Murmansk. They're feeling much more exposed along their northern border as oceans open up and more activity creeps in. In response, of course, Russia is modernizing its commercial and military infrastructure in the Arctic, strengthening its ballistic submarine fleet, making clear the Arctic's importance to their national interest and their willingness to defend it. And we've seen a significant increase in submarine activity, perhaps equaling that at the end of the Cold War. The mood in Arctic relations is really shaped more by Ukraine and by Syria than by the retreat and sea ice, resulting in much more mistrust and uncertainty about each other's intentions, reactivating some historic rivalries. Given the importance of the Arctic for China's strategic goals as well, they're also having more of a presence, although views differ on the legitimacy of its military threat at present. This has been accompanied by an increase in naval operations, more robust Arctic exercises, and shows of force from the Allies who've been demonstrating their capabilities and readiness for sustained Arctic operations. So there's been an establishment of a new Joint Force Command at NATO, Allied Command Transformation, focusing on defending sea lines of communication. And despite last year's US Navy strategy defining the Arctic as a zone of low tension, surface ships are once again making regular visits to the Arctic Circle. It reestablished its second fleet in 2018, sent a carrier to the Arctic Circle that year. And last month, the Sixth Fleet sent surface ships to the Barents Sea for anti-submarine exercises. Predictably, this, these have prompted a Russian response, including live fire drills in the Barents Sea last month, and occasionally some pretty irresponsible military behavior. With all of this increasing activity comes more potential for misunderstandings, for misinterpretations, accidents, and unintended consequences. And it's a challenging balance to strike between deterring aggressive behavior on one hand and avoiding provoking, provoking further Russian jumpiness and, and military buildup. Uh, well, on both sides, certainly. The most immediate and higher probability maritime security issues in the Arctic are incidents like a potential oil spill response or an increasing need for search and rescue capacities. And Navy and Coast Guard are essential in that. This has proven an area of cooperation between Arctic states, and there are other platforms for Arctic cooperation, uh, like such as the Arctic Council, that will hopefully in coming years help to de-escalate some of the military tensions. I'll close by saying that climate change is a high probability, high impact security threat, and incorporating climate risks into defense policy and planning has a bearing on mission effectiveness, and strategic advantage. These changes are not linear, and we continue to be surprised by the pace of climate change that we're seeing. Defense attention to these matters can help both governments and the public understand the nature and scale of the threats that climate change presents. And truly, climate change is, is not about polar bears, even in the Arctic. With that, I'll hand back to Nick. Thanks. Shiloh, thanks very much for um kicking us off with that uh, great tour d'horizon. Uh, and I particularly uh, liked your point about the fact that we do still have to um, see a lot of these issues through the prism of, of broader geostrategic um, relationships. And that has a, a significant impact on 
on how we view the challenges that, that climate and, and the environment and the, and the potential risks that, that, that they involve. Um, let's move on uh, straight away to, uh, to Alessio Patellano, who as well as being a specialist in military history and strategy and East Asian security is a particular specialist in Japanese naval and maritime history. And among his visiting professorships is a visiting as, as a visiting professor at the Japanese Maritime Command and Staff College. And I'm sure that's uh, the region where he will put the center of gravity of a lot of what his remarks are. But um, Alessio, please take the floor. Um, Nick, thank you very much for uh, um, giving me the opportunity to join uh, this conversation. As you know, um, the links between uh, naval missions and the impact of uh, climate change is something that, that I've been sort of keeping an eye on for quite some time. So it gives me tremendous pleasure today to have an opportunity to share some thoughts. Um, as you correctly pointed out, I will try to focus my remarks um, drawing upon my um, exposure the broader in the Pacific region, and that's primarily for, for, primarily for three reasons. Uh, first, uh, it is home to uh, the, some of the most dynamic um, economies in the world. It is considered by some as the world economic engine, but also um, home of more than 50% of greenhouse emissions worldwide. And so they do have something that links them directly to generating the problem of the climate, climate change. Secondly, it's a maritime centric region. So if we're talking about navies and climate change, we cannot uh, sort of uh, go and move away from the fact that this is a place where uh, this connectivity, this link um, uh, is particularly important, uh, not just in terms of maritime theatres, but also riverine connectivity and the importance of, of uh, uh, river networks that create a part of the climate change issues across the broader Ish, um, um, region. And, and the third reason is because this is a reason that is particularly disaster prone. And since the 1970s, more almost 60% of the total deaths from uh, um, disasters occurring the, the world over have been um, in this part of the world. And today, they also retain a particular large variety of um, uh, 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 climate change related hazards, earthquakes, flooding, cyclones, tsunamis, all featuring very high and, and center of this question. And in particular, we've seen over the last two years, but already a little longer than that, some sort of the establishment of a new normal, where both in terms of temperature and phenomena like earthquakes, uh, cyclones, flooding, taking place much more regularly around the region. So let me start um, by saying, with the core argument that I want to set forth um, in, 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 in my remarks. And um, what does climate change and security, sort of that nexus, what does it mean for navies? I think first and foremost, it requires a reconceptualization of where um, the um, uh, working, the missions related to managing disaster uh, um, uh, response um, should go in the Navy. If we think about it, uh, navies are custodians of trade, you know, they're at the center of prosperity. And when we think about the Indo-Pacific, climate change and prosperity go hand in hand. Um, and navies understand their relationship with uh, prosperity in two ways, as custodians of trade through maintaining the stability of the sea lanes, and as defenders of maritime rights and interests, as the Chinese define them, whether it is um, run the uh, fisheries, oils, gas resources within the territorial waters or um, in uh, the uh, uh, national and um, exclusive economic zones. And in peacetime, how they do this? They do this through defense engagement of naval diplomacy and through maritime security, which can be further divided into law enforcement activities um, and what I would define as a uh, problem-led reactive type of actions, whether it is countering, uh, countering piracy, crime at sea, the so-called transnational challenges that have become so fashionable after 9-11. Uh, broadly speaking, disaster response is uh, the sort of thing that happens within this reactive type of approach in peacetime. We do it if and when it is required of us. And I think what um, Charlotte made very clear in her point when she mentioned about the strategic value of that link, that connectivity, and it really is about, it's a call to raise the level from a purely reactive, responsive type of behavior to one that is much more leaning towards shaping activities that are conducted more regularly within the broader context of defense engagement, 
um, and naval diplomacy. In what sense or how you do this? How, what do I mean by this? Uh, disaster responses should not just be the sort of thing that we do once a disaster is um, uh, occurring. Most of the science suggests that prevention and behaving in a way that reduces the risk and allows us to have to be better prepared to manage when the crisis happens is a critical component towards um, uh, 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 fulfilling that mission better. So capacity building in the Indo-Pacific, Southeast Asian countries are particularly vulnerable and exposed by geography and by organizational structure and lack of funding. So addressing the ability to empowering local actors to be more capable in responding to the crisis, learning how to do that and learning how to work together with others, I think it's an important element of the equation. And it cannot be a responsive or reactive uh, type of mission. It has to be set at the center of a defense engagement. Why do the concept itself? Uh, the second is it's risk prevention, providing opportunities for uh, training, assessment, what the capabilities are, are, what things can be done. And then the third level is again, crisis response. But crisis response should be seen as the third layer of a series of building blocks that start with prevention and engagement to begin with, all geared from a naval perspective to generate influence, um, both to reduce the negative impact that climate change could have on prosperity and development of the places that we're talking about, as well as in managing traditional functions, uh, this idea of being custodians of trades, which today doesn't just mean about transports and trades, but also means seabed, um, um, cable, seabed cables, right? And the management, broadly speaking, of conflict, of which maritime and territorial disputes are an important subsection, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. So the main argument here is we need to think about mission related to the management of disasters a lot more as something that needs to be built inside shaping and preventive type of, um, if you want, traditional defense engagement or as naval specialists would have it, naval diplomacy. A shift away from the reactive to the shaping. Absolutely essential. And that is a doctrinal, a policy shift that needs to take place for everything else to start being approached in a different fashion. Why that matters? Uh, well, Shannon made it already very clear, but let me just sort of summarize two points um, that are very um, uh, relevant to the Indo-Pacific. Um, all science data tell us that both the frequency and destructiveness of disasters related to climate change taking place in the Indo-Pacific has been systematically increasing and it's going to remain as such in the foreseeable future. So expect more trouble ahead. This is no longer a question. We can keep it as a reactive type of mission because if or when it happens, we may decide to go. This is going to happen. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And that means both in terms of direct impact, the damage created by these events, as well as indirect um, impact. Um, and I can see that the sort of this progressive, slowly but continuously growing processes like sea level rising or the rising of temperatures of the sea as this indirect effect. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that these are not uh, sort of things that obviously uh, they happen every day, but they do not require that, that burst of important attention as a crisis would. However, insofar as the Indo-Pacific is concerned, this translates in three things. One, there is a serious crisis within fish stocks, particularly um, in the South China Sea and parts of the East China Sea, which is forcing fishing communities to actually diverse from traditional patterns, putting them at the front line of enhancing conflict and competition over resources among the coastal states within the broader Indo-Pacific region, but particularly east of Singapore. Um, reduction of biodiversity, which is connected to this. And then um, in terms of sea level rising, raising questions about A, um, coastal regions and exposure of mega cities in the broader, uh, particularly sort of east of Singapore, all highly exposed to the problem of sea level rising, but also specifically from a military perspective, um, the question of uh, military installation, particularly for intelligence monitoring and intelligence gathering information. There's a whole host of small radar 
um, installations, for example, across the East China Sea, uh, that would severely be impacted by the current trends. So this is a challenge that is taking a completely new proportion and the data suggests it's only likely to become bigger. This leads me to my third point. Does this all mean that human security related challenges and the nexus between climate change and security is revolutionizing the way we should understand um, security issues? And in particular, when we're talking about navies, is human security replacing state and state competition, which has been the light motive since the Trump administration came into power and published their latest national security strategy? My answer to this would be no, that's not quite the case. And again, here, I, I think I completely sort of uh, follow Shiloh's uh, lead and, 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 and points earlier on that human security related issues and in particular sort of climate change related problems will enhance as a sources for continuous competition in a geopolitical context that is already sort of well defined. And I'll give you a couple of examples about um, the latest sort of three months of activities in the, in the Pacific with particular reference to the East and the South China Sea, which are quite indicative. At the time where COVID was going on, um, and there were quite, from the pandemic perspective, this was a major issue that had to be sort of taken care of, uh, military activities continued unabated. Chinese military behavior in the East and the South China Sea uh, went on as usual. As a matter of fact, a larger number of uh, military activities and exercises were conducted. Chinese conducted the first night uh, strategic bombers uh, overflight across the Straits of Taiwan. It just started a couple of weeks ago, um, a two months long exercise in the northeastern uh, uh, region um, uh, facing the Sea of Japan and, and, and the East China Sea. Um, uh, whilst at the same time in the South China Sea, coercive activities um, against uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, were continuously taking place and um, all indicating that even though there was a crisis going on at the same time that did not meant that state and state competition or the geopolitics of structural sino-american competition and substructural regional competition over author and uh, uh, maritime uh, claims was put on hold if anything was becoming more heightened. As a matter of fact, if I were to put on a sort of a linear sequence, economic slowdown, which might be highlighted even more by the lack of prosperity or the development sort of problem generated by climate change related disasters, right? Leads to political instability, which in turn leads to further conflicts. And certainly in the way the Chinese have behaved over the last three months, this connection certainly seemed to exist. So climate change will not replace, um, if you want, um, and human security will not replace the way we should think about security issues and the way we deal with them. But in fact, they might actually further increase and compound existing tensions. Mind you, this is happening in a context where the Chinese Communist Party still has a 2049 uh, celebration for the 100 years of uh, China getting together happily ever after. That's a deadline that you don't want to miss. And the current leadership might feel the pressure of that even more if the economic slowdown that we're currently looking at continues or struggles to bounce back. Um, and again, as I was saying, if we look at metrics like the absolute average annual loss generated by disasters, uh, Japan and China are the two top contenders in terms of losses generated. In the, in the broader sort of Asia-Pacific region, Japan amounts for 40% in, in, in one single year, uh, China around 18%. So to conclude, uh, what does this all lead us or what this sort of uh, 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 implies for the Royal Navy? Uh, in particular. First and foremost, I think the key issue is this question of the intellectual and narrative shift. Where do we place within the context of the set of missions that define uh, what an organization does within the economy of national security? What is the place and the value that we give to uh, climate change and climate change generated security issues? And I think the answer to this is we need to start thinking about 
how to upgrade that place from the reactive space to the shaving phase in order to make it more sustainable and ensure that the damage to prosperity and development are limited to the maximum extent. The second question is more specific to capabilities. At the moment in this country, there is a debate that probably will very soon will put to questions uh, key items in the defense budget, whether it is the carrier or the sort of the, the expensive tickets that unfortunately see the Navy at the center of this discussion. If anything, in the Indo Pacific, the lessons, and I'm happy to talk about this in the question time, that we've learned from the triple disaster in Japan in 2011, the typhoon responses in 2013, typhoon in the Philippines, suggest that a high degree of expeditionary capabilities, including carrier generated power projection, are likely to remain, remain quite important to operate in the wider in the Pacific. One thing the Japanese case proved, particularly in a sort of a disaster that affected a large part of the population, was that considerable offshore command and control facilities would support, with the possibility to sustain life on board of large assets for a longer period of time while conducting um, um, HILO um, operation back and forth um, in the country were essential in the success in the most critical points of the response. So maintaining a degree of capabilities that uh, ensures expeditionary dimension to the UK profile, especially if the UK wants to remain a player in the Indo-Pacific, I think it's out of question. And within that context, high end of the spectrum capabilities will remain also something that needs to be considered centrally, because as I say, the start of security landscape that does not undermine the state of state of competition. In fact, if anything, it reinforces it. Lastly, there is a question of sustainability um, in terms of what the impact of climate change could do to basing, um, as well as the possibility to retain uh, understanding of weather partners, uh, uh, um, awareness uh, uh, systems, as well as all the other sort of enablers of, of operations that might very well be directly affected by the side effects of um, climate change. In all, um, I hope that this was not too much of a green picture. I tried to sprinkle some of my Italian genetics and positivity into it, and I'm looking forward to the conversation uh, as we move forward today. Thank you. Nick, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I, uh, my finger slipped in trying to unmute myself. Um, thank you very much, Alessio, for that, uh, for that contribution and um, uh, a great uh, um, set of uh, thought-provoking uh, suggestions anyway. Um, let's go to our next um, speaker, Mark Thompson, um, who is, as we know, is uh, with uh, PwC, is an environmental scientists with uh, more than 30 years experience now in advising clients on the environmental and uh, social impacts of their activities. He first joined PwC in 2000 and he has had experience uh, in the maritime space already at least in advising the Royal Navy on its contribution in the context of the prosperity agenda and I don't know if he might have some thoughts on how our discussion and the topic today and and that may or may not be in some ways related but um, Mark over to you. Thank you Nick and good afternoon everyone uh, it's great to to be with you. Uh, I'd like to confine my remarks to two main areas this afternoon. Firstly as, as Nick said to uh, to reflect on what I've seen in the corporate world in terms of its approach to managing sustainability and climate change issues. And then move on briefly to think about what that might mean for the MOD and for the Navy. So what have I seen over the last 30 years? I started my career back in uh, 89, I think, doing environmental impact assessment for large infrastructure projects. And that took me uh, to Hong Kong and Kuala Lumpur, among other places. And even then, you could see how environmental and social concerns were being built in to the planning of large infrastructure. The focus then became very much more around operational activities and understanding at a factory level, 
how to manage and control emissions to air and discharges to water. But then it moved beyond the direct control of business and the direct control of operations to look increasingly at upstream concerns, what we call the embedded concerns, sustainability concerns in supply chains. So brands and manufacturers increasingly taking responsibility for the resource intensity of their supply chains and for the labor conditions under which components and products were produced. And then more recently, again, you've had a focus increasingly on the downstream, looking at the impact that products and services in use can have on the wider population. So things like energy efficiency, for example, or the toxicity potential of certain products. And then moving on to thinking about the end of use of those products, the ultimate disposal, or possibly even recycling. And that's led to the development of uh, a strain of thinking called circularity or the, the issue of the circular economy, where increasingly companies are concerned to understand how they can conserve and bring back scarce resources so that they manage down the risks they have in their supply chain. So we could take as an example a phone company. So phone companies, amongst others, use a lot of a mineral called coltan. It goes into tantalum capacitors. So tantalum is one of four defined conflict minerals under the Dodd-Frank Act in the US, the other three being tin, tungsten, and gold. So any SEC-listed business has, for a number of years, had to carry out due diligence on its supply chain to work out where its supplies of these minerals come from and whether they come from the DRC or countries bordering it, and uh, attempting to manage down its reliance on sourcing from those areas. And this is because the trade in those minerals, the mining of those minerals, uh, which is essentially an artisanal activity, uh, is very much bound up in conflicts in sub-Saharan Africa. That's why the legislation was brought in in the first place. But if you want an example, as Shiloh was talking about earlier, of how sustainability concerns can lead to conflict and military conflict, then blood diamonds and conflict minerals provide good examples of that. So corporate, the corporate world has long recognized that avoidance of those concerns by increasing their ability to recycle materials, by tracking and tracing uh, high value materials that are in their products in use, and then incentivizing their, their, their customers to bring those back to allow them to be reused or reworked is a very important part of a more resource efficient economy. Now all this time, over the last 30 years or so, climate change has always been there. Back in the day, it was a little bit more in the background. We were more concerned with things like acid rain or the hole in the ozone layer. But even by 1992, when the Rio Earth Summit, it was clear that climate change was something that needed to be grasped at a global level. And so the Rio Summit established the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was a binding treaty on go governments to limit their emissions of greenhouse gases, such as CO2 and methane. But it wasn't until 1997 and the Kyoto Protocol that binding targets were set. And again, and more recently in Paris, those were superseded by new targets set out in the Paris Agreement in 2015. So countries are now on a path towards decarbonisation. Uh, the intent being to limit global temperature rises to no more than two degrees, which in some experts' view is the minimum requirement to avoid a catastrophic climate impact. And then again, more recently, uh, one of the last acts of the Theresa May government was to commit the UK to a legally binding net zero by 2050. So that then becomes the framing under which most corporate organizations are now approaching this idea of net zero and a response to climate change. They need to be able to, to describe their trajectory and the extent to which they're prepared to invest in that and the aggressiveness with which they'll pursue that. But I think at this point, I want to make a, a, a fundamental distinction between 
what has always been the nature of corporate sustainability reporting, which has been about companies and organizations reporting their impact on the planet or on the community. And something we're seeing coming in more recently, which is about the need to measure and communicate the impact of a changing context, a changing environment on the business. And this is far more existential in nature. Yes, you still need to report the impact that you're generating through your carbon emissions, for example. But increasingly now, organizations need to be able to respond and articulate the impact that the changing context will have on them. And again, touching on a couple of points Shiloh and Alessio made earlier about the need to anticipate change, plan for it, and to build in resilience going forward. So a couple of pieces of evidence for that. Uh, in, I think it was 2017-2016, Mark Carney uh, set up the task force for climate-related financial disclosure. So this reports to the G20 finance ministers, and it set out a set of guidelines which now over a thousand, uh, close to a thousand of the world's largest businesses have signed up to. And it commits them to reporting the future impact of climate change on their operations and supply chain in monetary terms. So that's quite a fundamental shift. Prior to this, if you were reporting on carbon and climate at all, it was historic reporting in tons of CO2 equivalent, which is a technical term that most non-technical people don't understand, and told uh, investors in particular relatively little about the future prospects of the business. So Carney's initiative is specifically to address that gap in understanding and to allow organizations to communicate in particular to their investors what the nature of the future holds for them. And if I can bring that to, a, I suppose, a personal reflection, uh, about six months ago, I had three separate calls with potential clients during the course of a week. And it was really striking what they were asking for assistance on. So I'm used to uh, clients calling me for assistance with their sustainability strategy, or their sustainability communication. But that wasn't the term that these three clients used. And two of them were bulk LNG carriers, and one was a Middle Eastern based oil company. And all three of them asked for assistance with an ESG strategy. So that's an environmental social governance strategy. Essentially the content is the same as a sustainability strategy. The subject areas co covered are broadly the same. But what's interesting is that ESG is the framing that the financial community uses for these issues. And so what you're seeing increasingly post Paris Agreement and a real uptick in the last 18 months or so, is the financial sector getting on board with this stuff and looking at the extent to which its investments may be at risk and holding to account its investee companies over the way they're managing those. And I think that is a really a profound sea change in, in attitude because where the money moves, everything else will, will follow. So that briefly was the corporate and the investor perspective. I want to just tackle one other area and that is uh, that of the employee or the recruit. And for my company, PwC, that's a generational issue. Uh, about 15 years ago, PwC made a commitment to the issue of sustainability and climate change, which it has sustained ever since. And that's through three changes of leadership, changes of, of senior partner. And that's because back in 2005, it understood uh, the science around climate change, accepted it, and recognize that inevitably the economic and financial consequences would follow from that. And also that this would be a significant issue for the people that we recruit. So we have 20,000 people in the UK and every year we recruit close to 1,500 of the best graduates. So that represents about 7.5% of our workforce. As an indication, so I'm, a, I'm very much the old guard at PwC. The average age of our employees is 27. And we know we need to pay them enough so that they don't go off to a, a magic circle law firm, for example. But when we've matched that pay, uh, 
what our research tells us is that the key factor for them is to be able to join an organization whose values align with their own. And one of the key issues around that is uh, climate equity and sustainability. So over the last 15 years, we've been on an extensive program across our operations and our service delivery to, to really put that into practice. But, so that's including, included uh, building or refurbishing our office space to the highest sustainability standards, uh, having world-class emission reductions strategies in place, uh, all staff being provided with personal carbon footprint data, and also investing in technology to allow remote working. And that, of course, in the last few months has paid off ahead of time. So I think uh, a day or so before the Prime Minister ordered us all to work from home, the firm had done the same with us. And on the first day of remote working, the technology stood up and 20,000 people were, were working well remotely. And it's perhaps a coincidence, but we have been Graduate Employer of the Year, Sunday Times Graduate Employer of the Year for 14 out of the last 15 years. So it's very, very important for this generation because they're clearly, they're more invested in the future than perhaps some of us over the age of, of 55. And we need to understand that and we need to recognize that. And if we're gonna engage with the workforce of the future, we have to get that right. And all this has been heightened, of course, by COVID and the economic and social disruption that it's generated. And we don't know yet how we'll emerge from that. We don't know how we'll go back and will we go back to the old ways. But there's a lot of discussion now about the opportunity to build back better and to not prop up, prop up old carbon intensive industries, for example. So in France and in Canada, you see uh, loans to businesses being contingent on commitments around carbon and reporting on carbon, demonstrating the will of government to try to direct corporate rec recovery in a different direction. So what does this mean for the Navy then? Well, clearly this is the context in which uh, large parts of the business world are operating. And we know also that government is committed to doing its part. So uh, government has a commitment to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And there is an ongoing review at the Ministry of Defense looking at the MOD's contribution to net zero by 2050. So what does that mean for, for the MOD? So a huge complex organization with a, a huge range and diversity of emission sources. Our experience suggests that there will be a relatively small number of activities and operations that count for the bulk of those emissions. So it will be crucial for the MOD to work out what those are. So in order to do that, it needs to review its existing data to determine different ways to categorize the MOD value chain and then map that structure in the most appropriate way. And that could involve taking a domain view, for example, so land, space, cyber, maritime, and so forth. And then for each domain, it will need to consider the key activities, equipment, suppliers, and stakeholders uh, that it needs to engage with. And then understand through dialogue uh, where those greenhouse gas emissions are most intense and where data is available to actually be able to, to map those. And having developed that understanding, it will then need to move forward to develop a strategy towards 2050. And what you might expect is that uh, clearly there'll be a need to develop some quick wins, some opportunities to build trust and enthusiasm and generate momentum around the initiative to improve uh, impact baselining so that the MOD and the Navy understands better where its emissions lie. Uh, to look at the various levers that currently exist that can be pulled to reduce uh, emissions intensity. And to think also about how that plays into its forward strategy and planning and procurement decisions. So, sounds like there's a lot to do. But the thing to take away from this, and I suppose my, my last reflection, is that large parts of the business world are engaged with this now. So the likes of Babcock, BAE, Leonardo, Boeing are all thinking this through, are all actively engaging with this agenda, and it will be a defining agenda uh, for decades to come. With that, Nick, I'll hand back to you.
Mark, thank you. that was great. Um, and particularly, uh, I think, in the context of uh, our final speaker on the panel, your, your point about the generational thing and, uh, you know, organizations with young workforces needing to have you know, climate equity and sustainability is, is surely something that uh, resonates in a, in a military context where you have a large, uh, large uh, uh, young population. Um, but um, as I say, we come to our final speaker in this, this first, first round of contributions of, of, of opening remarks, Vice Admiral Jerry Kidd, who took over his current assignment uh, just over a, a year, being quite an intense year for him with uh, um, all, everything going on, not these matters in the Gulf, and of course things more recently since, since the turn of the year. He joined the Navy in 1985. He's had some enviable um, seagoing commands that he's uh, had under his belt, including the former aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal, HMS Illustrious in a commando carrier role, essentially an aircraft carrier, and that's what she was for most of her career. And he took the new aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth to sea for the first time as commanding officer and was in charge for her first trials with the, um, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter off the east coast of the United States back in 2018. But um, Admiral Kidd, Jerry, um, over to you. Yeah, Nick, thank you very much indeed. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the invitation to speak on such an illustrious panel. I've been listening to uh, the contributions of everyone else uh, and nodding away uh, furiously here in my study uh, down here in sunny Portsmouth. So uh, delighted to speak to you all today as the fleet commander of the current Royal Navy on the subject of, uh, of the environment and climate change, what it means to, to my current fleet and how I think navies uh, have got a bit of a tension and a bit of a problem in uh, the challenges they face. I'd, I'd like to start right up front actually, uh, because fundamentally, when you look at the navy as an instrument of national power, you know, its, it's power comes from three key areas, which some of us are familiar with, which is the conceptual pillar, uh, the moral pillar, and the physical pillar, physical being the kit, the ships, the submarines, uh, the moral pillar being, being the values-based system, and of course, the conceptual element about, you know, how we go out about our mission sets. And I'd like to pick up on a point that Mark just made about his, um, uh, on the values basis of the young people. Uh, I've got 30,000 people working in the Navy. Uh, the average age uh, in my ships is about 23 to 24, with plenty of 16 to 17 year olds amongst that crowd, which makes one feel rather ancient, I have to say. Um, but you're absolutely right. Things are shifting and we have to react to the workforces we employ. Even in the military, even in a disciplined system, um, it's, it's been striking how things have shifted uh, for, for us in the military, particularly in the Navy, where we recruit, by, by and large, a, a pretty intellectual bunch nowadays, very technically minded, very connected, and absolutely orientated to, to the wider geostrategic uh, threats and, and environment that just was an anathema to me at the same age. And it's interesting that HMS Rally recruited 3,000 young sailors this year. And uh, in their joining interviews, um, it was not lost on us that the vast majority placed climate change uh, as the number one threat uh, to their future lives. Quite incredible, with hitherto have been money or cars or, or getting married and so forth. So the values-based system is definitely changing for us all. And I'm very aware of that as the fleet commander for the people I command. Uh, listen, the Navy deals in threats. Uh, we fundamentally are paid as an insurance policy uh, for the country um, and it's absolutely recognised um, that climate change, perhaps of all the threats we face, is the big existential one and a game changer. Um, so for me, the intellectual shift um, uh, that I think Alessio was talking about, um, we're lagging, quite frankly, in defence. Uh, we're doing a lot to catch up. A lot of it for me is about mindset, uh, you know, how we operate and also what we operate, and also the big question, for what operations? So in a way, it's, it's uh, you know, ends, ways, means. What is the strategy for navies in doing its part in being a good instrument that shows value for money uh, for nation state in this great global challenge we have? And let's face it, I think people are realizing with COVID-19 that borderless threats um, are indeed borderless and they become quite global pretty damn quickly. And if ever, there's, if ever there's a, there was a canary in the cage, it's been COVID-19 
for what climate change may bring in the next 10 or 20 years. 72% um, of the planet is seawater. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty aware that uh, we've been stuck very much, uh, certainly in the UK, and I think probably that's in most of the Western world, in a very land-centric mindset in terms of operations for the Navy against global threats, which is largely wrapped around uh, counter-terrorism, uh, insurgencies, Afghanistan and Iraq, and do you know what? It's taken 10 years exiting for those campaigns that only now where we really just trying to work out how best to utilize uh, the military instrument uh, for the betterment of, of, of the of nation's influence around the planet. Uh, and so for me as a, a maritime commander, I'm quite heartened. Um, I think Brexit for us, for the UK, if I could speak parochially for, for the UK, um, I hope all this is uh, Chatham House, but um, I, I see that the global Britain um, all one team agenda uh, and the way that this government is talking in a way plays largely to navies around the world and their utility. Um, I saw Xi Jinping's very interesting line uh, 18 months ago where he comments that the sea is now more important than the land, not just for his own prosperity agenda, but also he recognizes the key connector of nations in this borderless planet we live on uh, largely can be um, uh, illustrated by the connections of trade and sea routes. And the fact is that one ocean being affected now affects uh, another ocean. The planet is indeed blue, but it is indeed a, a small blue planet. Um, so uh, when I look at, um, Charlie calls it the threat multiplier. I couldn't agree more. Um, I look at every facet of climate change and I cringe with worry. Uh, the demand for navies and my, the, the Royal Navy is going up uh, all the time. You know, my force largely is bedrocked in Cold War, it's bedrocked against state-on-state uh, -state warfare, uh, largely against uh, the old Soviet threat. And that's still, we still have a hang up there, there's no doubt about that. But increasingly, I'm seeing the intellectual uh, conversations, particularly with London, morphing much more now to the soft emission sets. Uh, we understand that the Navy has, have always played a critical role in the security and regulation of sea routes. I mean, let's face it, that's why London is so prosperous today, was about the Royal Navy protection of the global uh, empire and trading routes that we established in the 17th and 18th century. And it seems to me we're going back to the future there. And the Chinese are illustrating with the Belts and Roads Initiative. And that is why the Chinese are very quickly building a blue water navy. Uh, so for the Royal Navy to get back into global operations is absolutely the right thing to do if we wish to progress the global Britain uh, uh, agenda. Um, I also see a greater push now uh, from other government departments uh, on the Ministry of Defence, um, DFID and the Foreign Office, particularly in things like protection of marine resources. Uh, fisheries are a big one. Uh, we did an awful lot of that 20 years ago. One remembers the Cod Wars. But I think as world resource gets ever more competitive um, and at the sub-threshold level, uh, below warfare levels, I think presence uh, and um, uh, understanding where we stand in terms of legality and regulation is going to be critical. And certainly the Royal Navy stands absolutely firm in uh, the Royal Base International System, which is being threatened uh, by other uh, global players. And for me, the role of my Navy is to act lock, stock and barrel. Uh, in being the front plank in, um, in the articulation and the enforcement of uh, global regulation on the high seas, the global commons, let's not forget. And picking up again on uh, the humanitarian disaster relief piece, uh, my word, there's one thing that's changed in my service career is about, about the amount of effort and training that goes in now uh, for my people and ships in terms of mitigating uh, disaster relief. I mean, the Caribbean, for me, last uh, hurricane season was, was quite uh, testing, I have to say. Uh, we're seeing global sea surface temperatures rising again in the Caribbean, even this week. And I expect this uh, year to be a pretty, another, a pretty frisky, stormy period in the hurricane season in the Caribbean. And going back again on the, uh, the nature of humankind moving ever closer to the littoral in megacities on the coastlines, uh, again, from the maritime flank, providing succor, support and aid, will inevitably become uh, much more of a Navy thing. Uh, so humanitarian aid, disaster relief, yeah, that's on the tip of everyone's lips. And of course, as 
huge utility and resource magnetism uh, for the political class, which of course we're not shy about. Uh, so I suppose in a word, it's about utility for me. Uh, what is the utility in navies in this fast changing world? And so the breadth of mission sets for me is growing. And of course that means how I train my people, uh, what is their mindset and their culture. I must protect the ability uh, to go to high-end warfare against state-based threats. My word, uh, shooting down anti-ship missiles and killing submarines is very, very different to tending people who have got no electricity uh, and no power on a beach in a war-torn area or indeed a disaster area. So um, getting the right people and getting them trained across all that breadth is actually quite a challenge. Um, understanding the environment is the other one. I think we're all um, understanding that, you know, getting out the presence around the planet is going to be essential, certainly for the Royal Navy. Uh, we've actually been quite a Navy wrapped around the Atlantic um, over the last sort of 40, 50 years since the Second World War. Um, and my force is very much uh, centered around a, a counter Russia perspective. But for me, going into the acquisition and procurement space, um, we're going to pursue uh, through this defense review at the end of the year, uh, move back to a balanced fleet. Uh, yes, we've got aircraft carriers. Yes, they can lift a lot of stuff and they can act in many ways and they can act as a sea base for many mission sets from warfare through to uh, lifting uh, humanitarian and disaster relief stores. But fundamentally, we're seeing other navies like China uh, utilizing soft power uh, ships like hospital ships uh, going around the world, uh, delivering aid um, uh, across all continents. And that, that actually buys a lot of influence. And I think for the Royal Navy, we have to look much harder now about what a balanced fleet means. Uh, we're pushing out um, OPVs, offshore provol vessels uh, into the Caribbean. Uh, the South Atlantic, we are having this aspiration to, to do more in the Mediterranean, the Gulf of Guinea, and of course, uh, to the Far East. As an instrument of uh, the national agenda, I think we recognize that the South China Sea to the Far East is going to be the power and the hub, um, of perhaps of world economy in, in a fairly short order. And therefore, I think it's uh, just a, you know, a no-brainer to think the Royal Navy will move back east of Suez in much greater numbers with much greater presence. And I think a lot of our proposition coming from the Defence Review would be about supporting that uh, much wider uh, global mandate. It's all about, for me, is uh, footprint and presence. Uh, but I do recognise, and look at Alessio, uh, Alessio uh, with his Italian background, the challenges that exist um, nearer to home in the Mediterranean as well. And then migration issue is uh, another uh, mission set that I do worry about, and not just across the English Channel, but indeed across the Mediterranean as the Sahel dries and we get the water resource issues. And what place uh, does the military play in that in what is essentially a regulatory and police issue? Uh, but when we see the numbers that are now expected to move uh, from continent, from country to country, and then we get to the more inaccessible areas of the Arctic and in due course the Antarctic, uh, where resourcing competition starts playing out in state-based activity. I watch uh, with interest now the militarization of the Northern Sea Route over the top of Russia. I see the uh, melting ice cap and I see increasing interest from commercial companies to save fuel, you know, 6,000 miles saving across the top of the Arctic uh, ice cap uh, from the UK to Japan. And I see increasing risk there in terms of state-on-state uh, -state conflict. And I, again, I see the breadth of the maritime mission sets uh, for my Navy and other navies just expanding. What does this mean for the cut and slice of the uh, Treasury cake uh, for all countries in terms of where they then balance their forces? And we talk about land, maritime, air, space, and cyber now being the five key domains. Where are we going to emphasize where we invest now uh, as a country from the UK perspective? And I'm sure it's the same for most, certainly Western navies, about uh, making sure they get their arguments right uh, to make a compelling argument to their own treasuries for uh, an increasing slice of that cake. Um, a last few points, integration with allies is critical here. I think it's a metaphor for the oceans that there are global commons. Uh, we operate with our navies on a daily basis. And that's not just Western navies. We operate with Indians, uh, most of the Far East countries, 
uh, would you believe we operate quite a lot with the Chinese and counter piracy. And actually, we even tip our hat to the Russians at, uh, that here and there. And so it's a great bond uh, in, across uh, all seamen and sea women uh, across the world's oceans. And I see integration with al allies, not at least in just in trend, but how we can provide a much more holistic um, uh, perspective from the maritime flank. Now, NATO has always been the bedrock of British defence doctrine. I think it's far wider than that now. And I think we'll see that increasingly, particularly on protecting of marine resources and marine uh, parks in the future. So the soft emission sets are going to become much more of a draw for me for acquisition, procurement and training. So there is a tension there for me between warfare and the soft emission sets. Uh, lastly, um, what are we doing about it in terms of procurement and acquisition? So I talked about uh, how we operate, uh, what we operate and for what operations. In terms of what we operate, um, I, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed here to say the Navy is probably the most non-green, um, most black um, part of the armed forces. We burn more fuel, uh, we go with more heavy metal to more parts of the globe and to the pristine areas than any other part of defence. Whether it's the Arctic, the Antarctic, we go with big bits of metal that take a lot of power to shift. And when we get there, we operate aircraft with jet engines and we go there with nuclear power plants too. Um, so uh, we're not shy of the challenge facing the Royal Navy, certainly in that. But we are making strides. I'll just end by giving you a couple of examples because there is an intellectual shift here and a mindset change. So my old ship, the Queen Elizabeth class, uh, 70,000 tonnes, three times the weight of our previous aircraft carriers. Uh, but they are six uh, times more fuel efficient, a fully integrated, full electric propulsion system, uh, meaning we've, we've grasped huge efficiencies there. Type 23 and Type 45 frigates and destroyers, much more efficient than their predecessors. And you've got to be careful here, because at a recent conference, someone took their hand up and said, well, 100 years ago, you used sail power, and that was very green. Can you not go back to using sails? I went, yeah, I'm all for it, uh, but I'm not sure it quite works in the current complex. But... Uh, um, refrigerants, uh, we're getting rid of uh, gas-based refrigerants at sea. Uh, we're looking at new technology for hull fouling uh, to be more compliant with chemistry, but making sure our ships slip through the water ever more efficiently to reduce drag. Uh, we're dismantling our nuclear submarines. So I've got 20 decommissioned submarines waiting disposal, seven in Scotland and 30 in Devonport. We're not proud of that, but it's exceptionally expensive. But we're doing it in a proper and prudent way to make sure that the low-level radioactive waste is disposed of in a, in a proper fashion. We're on the case for that. Um, and I think, you know, we're moving on in terms of how we operate. You know, when I look at how I hunt submarines with helicopters, a Merlin helicopter is 20 tonnes. It carries three or four human beings inside of it. That's a lot of carbon burn. And the move now to unmanned aerial vehicles, we're pushing on really fast in the Royal Navy here. I think the Queen Elizabeth class in 10 or 15 years will be racked and stacked with lighter, smaller, more agile, more effective um, unmanned aerial vehicles. And we're right on that with the US particularly. Um, moving Royal Marines in and out of theatre will be done by UAV. And we're even now going to be extracting wounded soldiers, wounded Marines by UAV, not by helicopter, uh, back to the sea base. So really good news there. And the other one I want to pick up on is simulation. Uh, we do a lot of our training by using aircraft, ships and submarines. 50% uh, of our training uh, in the next five years will be delivered uh, by a much more uh, carbon friendly by simulation. And the same same across naval bases where we're moving to waste recycling, much more efficient power distribution set work and less and less travel and by using Zoom a lot more where we can for security. So a whole bunch of stuff there. I know I've talked um, all over the show there from the strategic to the tactical. But I like to say I was really heartened by uh, my other uh, panel members that I couldn't agree more uh, with all of them. And I disagree with very little indeed. So I welcome the discussion and look forward to more questions. Thank you, Nick. Over to you. Thanks to all of you. And thanks, uh, Admiral, for rounding us off um, with, the, uh, with the opening remarks. Um, I do now turn it over to... Uh, the rest of our attendees to, to put questions. Uh, we, also, we already have um, a, few, uh, a few questions um, uh, to, uh, to, to pick from. And um, rather than abuse the uh, privilege of the chair, I'll go straight into um, the questions from the floor, as it were, because we've got about 20 minutes left now. And um, the first question comes from, um, my colleague uh, Ben Barry, who, who asks, um, how can 
greener and more sustainable navy, and I suppose organizations generally, um, uh, take place that is not more expensive and, and has an impact essentially on effectiveness, uh, less effective. Um, Admiral, do you want to, to pick up on that? And maybe, I don't know, Shiloh and, uh, and Mark have, have thoughts as well on, on that, that balance, that trade-off of, um, of um, uh, security issues. Yeah, uh, I will, I'll, I'll pick up on some examples on that because it's something that's a good question and we roll around. I'll, I'll do it very quick before handing over, but uh, yeah, we're, we're reducing our, I mean, as an example, we're reducing our uh, fuel burn, ships burn a lot of fuel. So we're basing ships forward again now. So we're not having to bring them back to the UK to do crew changes and updates and maintenance. We're sending them out of our HMS Montrose at the moment in Bahrain full time and my other APVs going out around the world. So uh, we're just going to be basically forward basing uh, properly and not having to bring things back. I talked about equipment, um, you know, lighter, sharper with less human beings in it to reduce carbon footprint. That does not mean more expensive. Uh, a Merlin helicopter is about 15 million pounds. Its mission set can be done by UEV far more cheaply. And indeed, it's the people that cost. So if I can avoid training pilots and observers to put on those aircraft and do it through network enabled capability, that is far, far cheaper for me because my cost base is humans, quite frankly. And the last one is how we actually conduct operations at the front line. Um, and that is about being more effective and more agile in the way we do things, i.e. not using a, a hammer to knock, um, to, to crack a nut. And that's all about uh, integration with space and cyber and doing things much more on the network basis, um, using information power and not just by kinetic and heavy metal. So that's three key examples for me where costs, uh, not least in money, money terms, but also carbon goes down. Shiloh, do you have any uh, further thoughts you want to, to bring in on, on this or, or Mark? Very briefly, I'll just say that it's, I think the Navy is the branch for which this is most difficult. You know, it's a lot cheaper to have renewable installations, um, you know, forward operating bases and so forth, powered by renewables rather than trying to move fuel around in theater. But for the Navy, it's, as the Admiral indicated, um, a lot harder to meet their mission requirements in terms of the kind of equipment that they need to transport um, using those sorts of renewables, although Mark may have a different perspective. No, Shiloh, I, should, I can see, uh, as the Admiral set out, you know, just what, what kind of a challenge that presents. And I noticed also from, on some of the written questions here, you know, one from, from Ben over you know, whether a greater dependency on nuclear uh, propulsion might be one sort of solution. I think the thing I want to address though is this idea that green is necessarily more expensive. I think yes when it's in an experimental stage well like most experiments you know you need to invest up front right but I think if you look at the the way in which the cost of uh, solar and wind generation has really plummeted the unit cost of, of that has plummeted over the last few years because it's starting to be done at scale and you get those efficiencies and you get that perfection of technology, it really can compete now with, with conventional forms of power generation. So imagine that at scale and, and the, the benefits that that would actually generate. And we talk to a lot of organizations now about their net zero trajectory and how they get from their current rate of carbon intensity to some form of zero at 2050. And what does that look like? And it looks really daunting, let's be honest about it. But I think the point for all organizations is you have to make a start. You have to make a start with the tools that are available now, and that will see you for, through the first five years. That will allow reduction. And you know what? If everybody is, you know, is, is engaged in this, in this endeavor, and we've just seen the, response, the global response to COVID now, the world can be substantially changed by these challenges. If we're all really engaged in it, the, the economies of scale that that will generate, and the new opportunities and the new technologies that we can't even uh, imagine now that will come on stream in five, 10 years time will carry us across the rest of that, of, of that journey. So that's clearly, uh, that's, some, that's an optimist's view. We're kind of going forward in the expectation that new things will, will, will come, to our, come to our aid. We don't have all the solutions in our toolbox at the moment, but we do absolutely need to make a start. Thanks all. 
I have a question here from uh, Yagendra Kumar, who is he's asking about, and this is specifically with reference to the uh, Indo-Pacific, um, what the, the actual effects are of naval operations, submarine surface operations, atmospheric um, uh, impacts on, um, on the sea, on the condition of the sea, if you like, and, uh, and air currents, and, does, and, and the extent to which this will be a, a driver for propulsion and other um, capabilities and, and, and even new weapons systems uh, in the future. Um, I don't know who would like to, to pick up on that one. Shiloh, is, that, is, is there a, a, an actual physical effect that's measurable as far as uh, maritime operations are concerned? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, the, I think the geophysical forces are, are stronger than uh, the human ones in that regard. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, as far as um, uh, the next question is, is concerned, um, uh, Bob, Bob Tarrant, uh, uh, retired Rear Admiral um, Bob Tarrant, um, uh, has asked a question about the priorities as far as um, climate change and economic recovery is concerned is there you know essentially going to be a, a trade-off will the will the economic recovery be be focused on recovery or will it be to do with um to do with climate change is there is there is there is there a balance there or is there a friction there mark do you want do you want to start with that one well i can i can try nick and i can again i can i can tell you what i what i hope might happen and I can also tell you what I fear might happen. So I hope, and we have to be very careful using words like opportunity in the current climate, clearly because COVID has been so devastating for so many communities, but it is a pause for thought. Uh, absent COVID, uh, we would likely have continued quite naturally on our current path. Uh, this has caused uh, a moment of reflection it's an opportunity to think about what we could to do differently. And as I mentioned with this, this initiative around Build Back Better, which is the theme that is, is being used, a lot of people are looking at this now and saying, right, as we come out of the impact, what could we do differently? Bearing in mind that things have, uh, have been put on pause. I think the other thing here is that um, pre-COVID, we could all perhaps proceed in the expectation that the, this complex global system with extended fragile supply chains was in some way bomb-proof or impregnable. And it meant it was very difficult sometimes to have conversations with uh, organizations about the need to build resilience into their supply chain. Now, there's just been a very graphic demonstration over the last six months of just how fragile a lot of this stuff is. And what I suspect is that that will mean that um, discussions around fragility of the system and the risks presented by climate change might be a lot more fruitful than they have been in the past because we've been given a graphic demonstration of what disruption looks like. So we do have, there is an opportunity to do things differently as we come back. And if we accept how, how uh, disruptive this small virus has been over the last three months. And we just do a little bit of uh, projection forward and thinking about how, uh, how much more disruptive some of these physical impacts might be over the next years and decades, then surely there's an opportunity there to think we need to be doing things differently and we need to be doing things greener. Thanks. Thanks. There are I have a couple of questions here that are, um, are UNCLOS related, one uh, from Paul and one from, uh, from Desmond Bowen. And, and um, to, uh, to uh, knock the two together, I, I suppose the, un the, the underlying question is UNCLOS is, is a foundation of the, um, the rules-based order, um, but is it up to the requirements now, particularly in a climate change context of um, changing sea levels and, and boundary delineations and so on and so forth? Or is um, uh, there, Des Desmond Bowen particularly asks, is there a more stringent uh, need for standard setting when it comes to these? Um, Alessio, do you want to, to try picking that one up? Yeah, um, uh, gladly. Uh, two very quick things. First of all, Anglos 
doesn't uh, sort of refers to what I would call the maritime order, right? Because the international, there is no single international order. There are different orders all interconnected in in the maritime space. UNCLOS is is the sort of main legal framework that defines the parameters within which we all operate. And in that respect, um, UNCLOS is uh, as useful today as it was when the third conference concluded. It's not out of date. Um, it's not lost its importance. It is a first sort of moment in history where a large number of, of, of state actors and non-state actors, by the way, because UNCLOS has got more signatories than actually uh, uh, states that exist in international affairs. That must be remembered, right? Um, and it's, so, so I don't think that just by, by observing just the deaths, right, the history of UNCLOS, suggests that it is not irrelevant or out of date. Was it built upon premises and knowledge that today is significantly different? Yes, the technology of the 1970s did not allow us to explore and understand seabeds and therefore some of the principles in UNCLOS the way we can today. However, so far that has not prevented state actors to understand the principles behind UNCLOS, what they codify, the spirit of it, and try to find solutions around it. So I think the question is not about whether UNCLOS is relevant or not, is whether and to what extent states today are less willing to buy into its spirit, which raises the fundamental point that speaks to what Admiral Kidd was saying, when the Royal Navy should be more out there, and it does defend the, the rule base of that. This idea that the international maritime order is not just about raw power, but it's about power and legitimacy. And UNCLOS, it's the ultimate provider of that legitimacy. The point is not that UNCLOS is irrelevant, but it's to ask state actors that do not respond in consistency with it, why are you not doing that? That undermines their legitimacy to be partaking as stakeholders to the international maritime order. Does anyone else want to chip in? If not, we've got a, a few more questions and our time is, is running out. Um, uh, we have one hand raised, and that is uh, uh, Gordon Wilson, uh, and I'd, I'd, I'll invite him to, to ask a question, uh, but I've also got a one or two others to, to round off on, so uh, let's see if we can try and fit those in. So, uh, Gordon, first, over to you. Hello, Rick, can you hear me? Can I hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, Gordon, we can hear you loud and clear. Can you go ahead? Yes, thank you, Matthew. I really like ask Admiral Kidd uh, uh, for um, this question put to him that actually, given the ex extraordinary expenditure we have in defending our whole status and structure uh, in the period of the coronavirus, and ultimately, uh, when we come to the um, defense of railway, it's going to come up later on, will we be able to defend our position given that, for example, 2% of GDP is much less than it is now, or has been up to the future, and also there are elements in the government who are perhaps, let's say, not so willing to dispose towards uh, resources going to defence at the expense of other activities. Gordon, thank you. Jerry, do you want to do you want to respond? Yeah, to you? I, I'll I'll uh, I've got to be careful what I say here. Of course, I don't want to come across as too. <laughs> Uh, ahead of the uh, comprehensive spending review, which happens in the autumn period, and alongside the uh, the integrated review, so I'll be rather careful. I, mean, I think I think we all recognise that uh, country's got to live within its means. We've been presented with a huge uh, upcoming economic challenge post COVID nineteen. Uh, the reorientation of the world order, I think, is ongoing. I think this is an inflection point, certainly, and the state response uh, across, you know, from grand strategy from capital is going to be interesting to watch as it evolves. And, and I have to say, I think the jury's out intellectually about where individual countries will orientate. Um, but I think one thing's true is that uh, there's, there's gonna be no more money. Um, that's for sure for defense. Um, oh, I think the little, if the settlements, even a, a, a small increase, I will be very delighted with that. Um, so I think for me, it's about uh, where, where we actually spend the money we are very uh, uh, gratefully received from the taxpayer. Uh, we will fight uh, from the Ministry of Defence perspective in the cross Whitehall negotiations uh, with the Treasury uh, to get our slice of the pie. But we recognise that we live in a, 
in a pretty fiscally taut uh, period coming up and we're all gonna have to live within our means. I would like to see more of that. Uh, would I personally, as a military officer, like to see more than 2% spent on GDP? Of course I would, and I think it's important. And I think it's getting the message across about, again, uh, what the military uh, uh, machine can do for the country and what it can do for the global security in, uh, in the regulation as we move forward. Uh, and getting that across is often half the battle when you're, when you're chasing resource. Over. Thanks very much. Um, we are pretty close to the end of our time. I've got a couple of, I think, possibly related uh, questions. One from Nicholas McLean. Um, Admiral Kidd spoke of a greater role for the Royal Navy east of Suez. Do we have enough ships or will the Royal Navy be spread too thin with its reduced, um, reduced capabilities? But also um, former First Sea Lord um, Philip Jones, uh, Jerry Kidd described well, the existing constraints on his options for fleet, fleet deployment, yet, yet Shiloh and Alessio imply mitigating climate change and environmental issues could play a greater role in naval dispositions. How are, high up the uh, current list of priorities do uh, they think such, do you think such dispositions should be? So the, you know, the, the home and away tensions, which may or may not be, um, be um, exacerbated to some extent, if you're um, you know, raising priorities on, on humanitarian and disaster uh, relief. Um, Alessio, do you want to, to kick off on that and then uh, perhaps if Shiloh wants to add something? Uh, yes, a, a couple of very quick points um, on, uh, on both issues. Um, I think the Admiral implied that already, but I think we're looking at the situation whereby there is a, the government will have to face a very hard choice and that is, does global Britain mean something? And what does it mean? If it is truly global, then the most dynamic and consequential parts of the world in international affairs are far away. That's a fact of life. And you have to reconcile that with, okay, there is no more money. We'll not go past that, which means that the Royal Navy will have to find a way to work in very difficult conditions. And I think that is, if, if, you're, not, you know, if you're not Italian, then you're not positive about life and you see this as, as an disadvantage. But I am, and I see that as an opportunity. Uh, the Admiral mentioned military integration with allies. And I think that is gonna be absolutely crucial to maximize the effectiveness of uh, new capabilities coming upstream with the Royal Navy. This isn't a, just a matter of numbers. Of course, Stalin was right. Quantity as a quality of its own. I get that, everybody gets that. But thankfully, new capabilities and technology in particular are contributing to rethink the way we operate. And in a way, the Royal Navy has an opportunity to go back to its past. The past of when it had foreign overseas stations that kept the cost down and enabled to maximize the flexibility and operational viability of assets on site. So I think with limited numbers, you can still work out a way to get around it if you have very good and, 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 and sort of viable working relationship with key partners um, and the sustainability that only you can have with partners. And so having fewer sort of holes available and assets available so doesn't necessarily mean you are a disadvantage. And none of these questions can find an answer until the government turns around and clearly commits that Global Britain actually means something. And that means it will require the government to come out of a protective shell and, and say like, actually, we are staking behind an expeditionary oriented posture for our armed forces, because in order for Britain to be global, it has to be maritime, it has to be out there. Sorting out the details, it's about working with allies and partners, not just individual capabilities. If these answers sort of get aligned together, then the sky is the limit, um, sort of metaphorically speaking. Shiloh, do you want to? Yeah, just to just to draw out a bit of one of Alessio's points, the fact of the matter is we're not going to be able to keep up with demand. And so I think it's essential really to work with others on, on prevention. And the UK and other countries, well, particularly the UK, is really blessed with an excellent research, a physical science research community and a lot of strong relationships that can be leveraged in order to advance a, a prevention agenda internationally that can help to try and keep these issues from adding to the military burden. All in there, thanks. Uh, Admiral Kidd, do you have anything to add? No, I, I just agree with having Alessio and Shiloh just said, absolutely. Uh, 
And I think also, uh, uh, plus I'd also add that the attributes of navies shouldn't be forgotten here. We're not a fixed um, asset because we're global. We also, we move. So we're elastic. And I think that's, people forget that whether we, as you spread bet across the planet uh, to, to, to conduct missions wherever you need it, of course, we can then morph very, very quickly, unlike other arms, uh, to another mission set extremely fast. So we're a contingent force forward and back. So it's not as uh, it's too di it's too uh, binary to say home and away. Uh, I like to say it's a spread bed around the planet, and it's all about balance. Uh, but I, I agree on on the allies. So it's also operating with NGOs. Um, um, and all those other facets of government we have at our availability. So it's, it's, it, it, for me, this is now all about a team game. That's what it's about. Thank you. We're, we're, we're sort of up against our, our, our time, our scheduled time. If, you, if, if, if the participants don't mind, I might try and squeeze in just a couple more questions uh, to round things off. Um, um, one is uh, from uh, Commander Connor O'Neill, uh, and it's, um, if the, as the panel has outlined, HADR is likely to become routine and thus uh, should be managed proactively, uh, as, as Alessio, you were, you were talking about, then isn't, isn't that actually um, a civil, more a civil responsibility? Um, and I suppose, you know, is, it, is there a danger that the military will go chasing after, um, after roles? Uh, and, and finally, from uh, Tony Graham, um, uh, formerly a director, director of ships at the MOD, I believe, um, climate change is one of a number of long-term trends requiring organizations that are better at strategy change management and adaptability. How will the Royal Navy modernize itself and not just its hardware to meet the challenges of those longer term trends? Um, I'll, I'll invite Alessio as he raised the point about being proactive. Is that really a role for the, the military um, to be in the lead on? And then anyone else pick up on that and then perhaps um, Admiral Kidd, uh, if you could, uh, uh, respond to that perhaps and, and, and round off perhaps with Tony Graham's question. Uh, I'll be very quick and um, I'll try to leave up to stereotypes about Italians and use a football metaphor right now. Um, when you, the same play, game, if you play at home and if you play in a different kind of environment, it puts a different pressure on the team. So even though from a UK perspective, response and contribution to disaster relief in the UK, it's very much of a civil related mission. When you're operating overseas, the environment is different. That mission is carried out in a complex security environment in which disaster response is part of the picture. It's what Amir Oki earlier on mentioned as the softer mission set, right? But it's part of a complex uh, 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 set of security issues, which for example, in the Indo-Pacific require you to operate in what is a constantly uh, high end of the spectrum populated environment. It, when the triple disaster in the 2011 happened in Japan, the Japanese military was responding in force to a, 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 a massive uh, a, a compound disaster, whilst at the same time being probed by the Chinese military in terms of their defenses in the Sea of Japan and the East China Sea. So you're operating in a different environment in which this is not just a purely civil response, it's a response that by its very nature requires the military to be on the lead, but it also requires the military to learn more than ever how to coordinate its way to operate and explaining the understanding to other components, NGOs, government, about how it operates when it is overseas. And again, if you go back in history, the Royal Navy was very good at doing that. Um, we, you know, everybody knows the many anecdotes of Admiral Nelson's operating in the Mediterranean, up and down, working always with their civilian counterparts to maximize the effectiveness of British foreign policy. That's something that we need to learn to do. It doesn't make the mission a, a civilian mission. It makes it a mission that it's all about the team, as was mentioned moments ago. And that team has civilian components, but because it's part of a complex security environment, it requires the military to remain really at the center of it anyway. Does, before I ask um, Admiral Kidd perhaps to have the last word, do, do either of the other panelists want to chip in at all before, um, before I hand over to Admiral Kidd? Uh, thanks, Nick. Yeah, I, again, I, again, I violently agree with Alessio. I, mean, I think um, I've been in the situation myself several times where it's the, the attributes of the military <laughs> tend to lend itself to be a first responder, uh, not least so we can get places, um, particularly in the littoral with ships that are shallow. Um, we have the lift in terms of helicopters and aircraft and moving medical 
supplies and people and fuel, which is always the critical enabler in a disaster relief area. We can provide security, of course, uh, which is often uh, a, a component people forget about when law and order breaks down. And the sea base itself, just offshore, provides a sanctuary, which people forget, which has its own uh, power, water, food, and so forth. And the last bit people forget is about comms and also uh, the military offshore in at right at the point of the, the problem uh, provides an, uh, an honest and direct and quick information flow for decision makers back in other capitals. So, so all those attributes combined make uh, the military the obvious first responder. Uh, that's not to say that uh, we wouldn't welcome more civilian integration as, as early as we can, but the fact is they just take time to mobilize. Um, the part of the uh, thing the taxpayer pays for is having militaries that are contingently ready and, uh, and able to react to quite quickly. And we can move the aircraft carrier 500 miles a day. So we can, we can get to an area, a problem area, pretty damn quickly uh, wherever we are. Uh, the last uh, point, and thanks very much for, for giving me this, or the honour of having the last this call, is on the excellent question about um, the conceptual shift required. Um, really tricky one, but I think uh, I'm heartened and I'm reassured. I mean this genuinely. Uh, I'm 53, but going back to my early question that Mark Thompson picked up on is the um, just, just the all-round quality uh, and the reflective quality of our young uh, people coming into all our organisations, uh, not least the Royal Navy. So for me, the hope is the human capital uh, that's coming in that are far more um, aware, uh, far more open to uh, shifting cultures and mindsets. Uh, so for me, the conceptual shift is one of you need to slow younger people down. Uh, sometimes they need to actually be, <laughs> uh, be, be balanced. Uh, uh, there's no shortage of good ideas, that's for sure. And the diversity that I see, uh, particularly as we work more with civil authorities in the commercial world and with other key allies, that always bring a different perspective is really heartening. And I've been very grateful in my career, certainly in the last 15 years, to see the, uh, the openness within which um, not the militaries accept uh, civilians and uh, commercial world in, but actually the other way around, because people often uh, hitherto have been scared of militaries. And I think it's much more heartening now that uh, we see each other for what we are, all human beings faced with the same global challenges. And the solution space is ours to do together in, in one team, one function. Over. Admiral, thank you very much for um, uh, rounding off uh, what I think has been an excellent discussion. I've certainly learned a lot. I'm not even going to begin to summarise it because it, it certainly it was a tour d'horizon and, uh, and, 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 um, a, uh, and, and a bit of um, virtual globe trotting as well in terms, of, um, in, in terms of the regions we've discussed. So um, I think, thank all the, um, the, uh, the attendees who, uh, who, who tuned in, but in particular I'd like to thank our excellent panel, all of whom have uh, provided excellent uh, food for thought. So I appreciate that. We can't, we can't um, in reality, uh, uh, offer our thanks to you all in the traditional way, but I'm sure um, um, virtually everyone is, is, is joining me in, in uh, expressing my gratitude and our gratitude for, for all that uh, you've delivered today. So thank you very much. And um, that's it.